In the autumn of 1986, a man was found sleeping rough at a bus shelter in Cork. He was tall, white, had dark hair. He had a thin angular face and the clothes he was sleeping in basically uh, were worn, crumpled. So the Gardaí were called and they chatted to him, but he would tell them very little. There was a dog that he had with him um, and he would tell them that the dog was, quote, on loan. He couldn't or wouldn't tell them his name, his address, why he was in Cork. Um, he told them that he had lived in Dublin for some years. So from that bit of information, like if he had a Cork accent, they wouldn't have asked why he was like, what, what are you doing in Cork? So I imagine he's not from Cork. The same as in if he had a Dublin accent. I mean, it's obvious, you know, like if you're in Cork, you'd still know if someone was from Dublin. Like it's, it's a pretty distinct accent. So I would imagine then he didn't have a Dublin accent. So maybe he didn't have an Irish accent at all. Like he could have been from the UK. He could have been from, you know, England, Scotland, Wales or whatever. Um, that's really just, a, that's just me kind of guessing or assuming because all all the information we have is like he said that he had spent many years in Dublin. It was also noted that he was living a hermit's life. The Gardaí brought him to um, a psychiatric hospital. We don't know which one. Um, it was ne It's never been said. I'm not sure like I don't know if that's kind of standard procedure or was he displaying certain um behaviors maybe that they they needed to bring him there i'm not really sure like if you find someone who just doesn't know their identity i don't know if the standard kind of procedure is you bring them to a psychiatric hospital um so it could be that or it could be that maybe he was starting to display some uh behaviors that would indicate mental health issues so the psychiatric hospital anyway when he was admitted they gave him a name so obviously we just know him as john doe the name that they gave him could be like Paul or Frank or whatever. Um, they never released this, so we only have John Doe to go by. They estimate his date of birth at 19, around 1930. So that would put him in his late 50s or early 60s at this point. Okay, so it is reported in the news articles that I'll tell you about that all efforts to establish his identity were like failed. But I can't find any information on these efforts. So I can't find anything about like appeals or photo fits or a photo or anything like that about him. So I don't know if that was ever done. I'm not saying it wasn't done. I'm just saying I just I can't find it. It was determined that John Doe had a history of schizophrenia and he had dementia. Um, again, the news articles just say that he has the two of those uh, conditions. It doesn't say... Like, I don't know if he had dementia when they found him in his late 50s or 60s. I mean, you can get it then. Or was it as he was in the hospital longer that he developed dementia kind of into his 60s, 70s, 80s? I'm not really sure. So John Doe basically lived in the hospital for over 30 years. And again, I don't, there's not a lot of information out there on uh, if they did make a lot of efforts. I don't know. Um... The first article that we come across is in May 2020. That's the first time that there's any kind of official information about him anyway. That's actually around the time I think I came across the case. I definitely came across it in 2020 because it was during the pandemic that I uh, remember finding it. Because I remember seeing it and then I met up with a friend socially distanced in uh, Phoenix Park. And I remember telling her, I was like, did you know that we have like a man who's like who's in a hospital unknown who he is has been stuck in a hospital for over 30 years uh so that's kind of roughly around the time that i found it the reason it was in the news was because of a court appointment a court date so basically the hse went to court uh to file like an ex parte motion which means like that the other person doesn't need to be there and it was essentially to start proceedings for uh ward like what court wardship um by this point, he, John Doe is in his like late eighties or nineties, um. So obviously, it's kind of determined that he doesn't have the mental capacity now to make decisions for himself. His health is deteriorating. He has cardiac and respiratory problems. He's had several like hospital admissions to like ge a general hospital. The HSE noted that he had recurrent respiratory 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 tract infections and fluid retention from heart failure. 
basically his clinical team said that it wouldn't be an, wouldn't be appropriate to resuscitate him should the situation arise that he basically that he should just be made comfortable and they had come to court because like that they didn't the doctors were worried that he didn't he didn't have the capacity to make this this decision for himself um however it is noted that at some point anyway he had said um that he no longer wanted to go to a general hospital if he was to get sick again so in September 2020, the HSE, they were back in court again and the HSE asked for permission to take a DNA sample, uh, basically to like, I think, speed up pos posthumous uh, proceedings. So basically after he died to kind of speed up the proceedings of trying to identify him. Justice Mark Hesling determined that he should be made a ward of the state and solicitor Alec Gabbett was appointed as his guardian. The medical assessment basically determined that he did lack the mental capacity to make these decisions for himself. Uh, Mr. Gabbett also went to see him, you know, just kind of see for himself. And again, he said like he, he was not in a position to make these type of decisions himself. He said that he was in the best place and that the staff and other patients had basically become family. And uh, it, it is noted that when the discussion of moving him was brought up, that the medical staff actually had uh, tears in their eyes. So then we skipped forward to March 2021. I don't really know why it keeps doing this, but in March 2021 then, um, again, the HSE and the guards are asking to be able to take the DNA sample to speed up the posthumous proceedings. A documentary maker actually approached the hospital and the HSE. I don't know how they knew who the hospital was, but anyway, um, approached them about making a documentary in like a last ditch attempt to identify John Doe. Neither uh, thought this was a good idea. Then we skip forward to May of 2021 and it says now that the HSE have decided not to seek the DNA, the DNA sample um, and that the guards have said that this can be done posthumously. It is reported that John Doe told the staff that he did not want to be identified. Uh, Justice Mary Irvine, who was basically looks after like all the, war, you know, like the wardships, the wardship list, I said, so I'm guessing like all the wards of the state. She basically said that she was concerned that there was no, there seemed to be no detailed care plan put in place for if the situation arises where John Doe needed CPR. So she actually adjourned the case until July 5th, where a care plan was supposed to be in place now when you look there is no there's no more follow-up on that so i don't know if that court uh court appointment actually ever happened then on july 5th sadly john doe passed away on september 23rd 2021 um in the psychiatric hospital and i have to assume that it was you know that he was surrounded by those that he had come to know as family for 35 years there has been no more updates i've been i've been trying to keep track of it um since he passed so i have to assume the sample has now been taken obviously because it's may of 2022 so i assume the sample has been taken and that they're obviously just waiting for a hit if there will be one the fact that john doe says like that he doesn't want to be identified it makes you think that he knows who he is maybe um and that he just doesn't want to be identified as that person anymore perhaps i know like with dementia you can get like flashbacks and stuff so possibly maybe he doesn't always know who he is but he gets these snippets of past memories and knows like the thing is maybe he maybe he was worried that if his identity was known that he would be you know released or something because think about it 35 years in a hospital you're de you've definitely become institutionalized and maybe he just had a fear that they would just kick him out the other thing is maybe he didn't know and that's it maybe he he became this new person like let's say they called him frank and he had the same nurses and the same you know for a lot of time there'd be in psychiatric hospitals there'd be some long-term patients and especially probably whatever ward he was under could have been so he might have created this whole new life essentially in the hospital where that's that's who he was let's say i'm just using frank as an example he was frank this is where he lived. These were his friends. This is who looked after him. You know what I mean? Maybe he had, you know, he had his little hobbies and he had his little things that he don't, I don't know. I don't know how obviously severe the dimensions just was from the beginning of him being in there. Or maybe he has a dark past. Maybe he has a secret. Maybe he is shunned by his family. Maybe he was shunned. Maybe he shunned them. Like maybe there's a reason he doesn't want to be identified. So that's 
basically the story of John Doe. Um, like I said, I came across it during the pandemic when it first started in uh, 2020. I think I came across it in the summer of 2020. And I hadn't really looked at it again um, until kind of recently. And like that, I discovered that he had passed away. And I don't know if I, I was disappointed as if I thought like he was magically going to one day say like, oh yeah, no, this is who I am. I think always this, the only solution was going to be to take a DNA sample. And I suppose if he didn't want that to be done when he was alive, it had to wait until he had passed. Um, It's a very sad case, you know, to think that someone is that alone. Um, Again, we don't really know what he done in the first 50 years of his life. The one thing is, I suppose, that he didn't, he probably didn't feel alone because I was thinking about him feeling alone, but he probably didn't feel alone. Like he, he thought he was surrounded by family and friends. Like he had people, you know, looking after him every day. He had people who would have been coming to chat to him every day. It was most certainly probably a better life than he had had sleeping in the bush shelter, you know. Yeah, so the reason I suppose I wanted to do this, <laughs> the reason I probably wanted to do this case was because it made me sad. Um, and so I thought I'd share with you so you could feel sad. <laughs> no, sorry. Um, no, I just thought it, it was, I thought it was an interesting story because like that, it's never, he's never been identified in 35 years. I don't really, I can't say if enough efforts were made to identify him and I can't say that they weren't. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I just thought it was an interesting case. I'm just trying to remember I said I'm trying to do like little mini kind of videos in between doing the Operation Trace videos. Um, yeah, so I mean, hopefully, maybe one day we will know who John Doe really was. So I have a cheeky little favour to ask you. Um, if you like, if you liked this video, or you like my videos in general, um, you probably have already liked and subscribed and stuff like that. If you haven't and you do like it, please do it. I really appreciate it. I appreciate all the comments and stuff. And then if you know other people who like true crime, uh, let them know about me because I'm still an itty bitty one. So, you know how YouTube does all that stuff. It's hard to find the itty bitty ones. So share me. <laughs> yeah, um, that's it, I think. Yeah, thanks. See you in the next video. Bye.